welcome to this installment of the Canto per Canto podcast project of the Dante Society of America. I'm Beth Kagashal. I'm assistant professor of Italian at Florida State University. And I'm also co-editor of the digital archive Dante Today with my co-author Ariel Saber of Bowdoin College. And I'm here today with Deborah Parker, who is professor of Italian at the University of Virginia. She's the author of many books and articles on Dante and especially on um, Dante's re reception in the Renaissance, um, among many other subjects. And in particular, I want to highlight her work as the creator of a pioneering digital humanities project, the World of Dante website, um, which many of us use as a terrific resource for teaching and for scholarship. So Deborah and I are here to talk about Purgatorio 16, which to my mind is the central canto of the poem not only because it is the 50th canto of Dante's 100 cantos, but also because it's in this canto that Dante spells out the principles on which the, the moral architecture of his poem rests. Those principles being, or those questions being the origin of evil and the logical necessity of the complete freedom of the human will. So Deborah and I will, will certainly get to this central question, but Deborah, because you and I both share an interest in the visual reception of the poem, I thought we'd kick off our conversation by, by starting with the vis visual element of the canto. So can you start us off but just by describing the scene on the third terrace, the Terrace of Wrath? All right, so yes, this is um, the Terrace of Wrath and the canto begins with a description of the punishment of the wrathful. They are enveloped in a thick, noxious, viscous smoke, which not only blinds the wrathful themselves, but also Dante and Virgil, who must enter the smoke uh, to speak with the soul, the central soul, who is Marco Lombardo. Um, the rationale behind the, the punishment or the contrapasso, the explanation of the the punishment is clear, just as the wrathful were blinded by their anger in life, so are they literally blinded uh, on the terrace of purgatory as they're working through their, their uh, purgation. And Dante had a very similar punishment in hell where the wrathful were writhing in a muddy swamp, sticks. So there are a couple of images that really strike me when I'm thinking about this canto, images that I always try to keep in mind when I'm, when I'm teaching it or when I'm thinking about it. There are, as, as Deborah, you of course know, the, there are Doré's very dark illustrations um, where he depicts the smoke rising up the mountain and the, the gaunt Marco who is leaning against the slope of the mountain. But the image that I always find most suitable, especially for teaching um, this part of the encounter is John Flaxman's illustration which depicts the pilgrim proceeding through the smoke, very closely standing behind Virgil. And the pilgrim has his eyes closed, but he also has his hand fixed over his eyes as if he needs that second layer of protection to fight against that heavy, stinging, acrid, noxious smoke. Um, he's mm -hmm. also following very tightly behind Virgil, who's the figure of reason in the poem. And that figuration feels to me like an important depiction of good anger, um, the kind of anger that we're meant to cultivate, ira bona, which is the, that kind of anger that's guided by reason and that we feel in response to say an act of injustice or, um, or to, to um, the observation of sin in the world. That kind of anger is a healthy kind of anger that the canto I think is really trying to to inculcate in us, as opposed to the, um, what he calls the iracundia, the, the like disposition to wrathfulness um, or the quickness to anger that these penitents are trying to work through. So we've, we've talked about the smoke, but the smoke isn't the only aspect of the penance that we wanted to discuss. So Deborah, did you want to say something about the sound of the canto, the, the singing of these penitents? Yes, um, well, all the penitents that Dante and Virgil encounter on the mountain of Purgatory, they're all chanting one, uh, a hymn, and most of them are liturgical chants, and they're chosen because of their 
appropriateness for the sin that's being purged. And since we're on the terrace of anger, the song that the penitents sing is the Agnes Dei, that is the Lamb of God, which appropriately uh, emphasizes the meek and mild side of Christ. Because on every terrace, there is an, um, the, the penitents experience the examples of the opposing virtue, as well as examples of the sin punished. So uh, they're often called whips and bridles. So the opposing virtue to anger is uh, meekness. Yeah, um, yes. I've, been thinking, I've been thinking a lot about meekness and what that means. Uh, you know, as I was preparing for this conversation, I've been thinking about um, what meekness looks like. And I think when I was originally thinking about the word, I tend to think about meekness as being equated to submissiveness. But I, was, I looked back at the examples of meekness. I was thinking about you know, your, your points mm -hmm. about um, the meekness of Christ's nature and the examples of meekness that we get in Portugal Dio 15. And that meekness, I think, is, is, not, is not anything close to submissiveness, but is in fact the, um, it looks to me more like like a, a gentle, a gentle commitment to righteousness. And so we think about mm -hmm. like St. Stephen, for example, who's the, um, the martyr, who's one of the exemplars. We're getting a little bit into, into the previous mm -hmm. canon, but in any case, um, um, that the meekness of St. Stephen, um, the, the first martyr of the Catholic Church, is one that does not submit, stands firm in its, in its commitment to righteousness, and yet does so gently, does so with a humility. I also think a lot about, you know, because we're in 2020, we're having a lot of conversations, summer of 2020, we're having a lot of conversations about civil rights and revisiting, revisiting the civil rights movement of the 60s. And so I think a lot about uh, Martin Luther King's attitude of passive nonviolent resistance, um, the kind of the kind of meekness of that, the mildness of that resistance, which is still nevertheless resistance. It's not submissiveness. Yeah, and the, yes, that is something that, that we are having a lot of response right now, uh, lots of res, um, social unrest. But in, if we think about two other figures, Malcolm, Malcolm X and James Baldwin, they represent two very different responses to racial inequality and injustice, but King's response is uh, the one that stands out most as a contrast because of his recommendation of a, um, a, a, a nonviolent response. The other point that we want to make sure that we remark on before we before we move into the real meat of the canto is to remind ourselves that the entire conversation that's staged here between Dante and Marco Lombardo, um, this conversation about the origins of evil, that the, the entire conversation takes place in complete and utter darkness. Um, the very first words of the canto are buio d'inferno, the darkness of hell. Um, mm -hmm. And I think we tend to forget as we, I, I always try to remind my students when we're reading this canto, um, that this conversation, the, the pilgrim is there with his hand over his eyes, leaning closely on Virgil's shoulder to pass through the smoke. He cannot mm -hmm. see anything. And so he's kind of forced into this inward reflection by the very darkness of the circumstances in which this, um, this conversation is taking place. Yes, and despite the fact that everything takes place in darkness, um, Dante earlier compares it, the, the darkness to a starless night, that they are, Dante is nevertheless um, illuminated by the end of the canto because he learns what he is dying to learn, and that is what is the cause of evil in the universe. And so, yes, it takes place in darkness, but da the, Dante the poet juxtaposes um, blindness and insight very effectively throughout the canto, whether it's in the form of um, contrasting the heavens cello with the earth and yes. the condition of the living. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's a really beautiful point that he, um, that, we're, that we're kind of always thinking about light in this canto that is, um, you know, when we think about the scene of it, it's very dark. So why don't we cut to that, um, that, that central conversation that they have. We'll get to the, the pivotal encounter between Dante and Marco Lombardo. Um, 
So Dante in this, in, uh, uh, the pilgrim on this terrace meets um, Marco, who scholars, uh, at least to my knowledge, have not successfully identified mm -hmm. with any particular historical individual um, or historical personage, um, but who is presented here as a worldly figure. He says, um, mm -hmm. he says, del mondo sepi um, e qual valor, qual valor ha mai al quale, ha, um, al quale ha or ciascun disteso l'arco. Um, so he says, he says he's one who knows the world. So he is um, worldly, I always emphasize that he's worldly, but not earthly. He's a, um, a figure who is committed to um, human value, human worth. And he makes this remark about, about the, the um, human society no longer directing its arrows at the target of human worth. That remark occasions this question from the pilgrim, which, um, which as Deborah said, he's been sort of desperate to know for such a long time, um, which is where does evil come from? And um, very specifically, the question that he asks is, do the stars influence our behavior? Do our behaviors um, take direct, um, a, a direct determining force from the alignment of the stars, um, either at our birth or at the moment we're making the choice, or are we free to make whatever choices we would make? And I think that question to us in the 21st century doesn't sound like such a live question, but it certainly was one for Dante. Um, I mean, we no longer consult horoscopes, or at least we don't do so very seriously. But Dante really thought about astrological determinism as being a very serious determinant, a serious condition or constraint um, on our behaviors. And so when I teach this canto, I always like to get my students to think with me by analogy of other determining factors or determining forces that are external to ourselves that we think of as um, placing some kind of condition or constraint on our free moral agency. And so we generate a list on the board of those determinants, which could be things like heredity or um, upbringing, they could be education, class, racial or gender identity, the ways that we think about and construct those things in our imaginations. Um, they're all biological and or cultural frameworks that we that we tend to think about as conditions or constraints on our moral agency. Um, when I teach this in the fall, I'm sure I'm going to talk with my students about um, systemic injustices that are structured into our social or political institutions um, or prejudices that we have maybe internalized um, since our birth or um, through our upbringing. I think we use a lot of those conditions as excuses for our moral choices. We tend to blame those conditions or, or to praise those conditions for both our, our um, good moral choices and our bad moral choices. Marco talks about the heavens in, I think, a similar way. So he says, for example, that the heavens initiate your movements. I, I I vostri movimenti inizia. Um, so the heavens, just like heredity or identity or culture, tradition, the heavens predispose us toward certain ways of thinking or behaving, of speaking, reacting, and so on, um, to the world, to, the, um, to what we see in the world. But Marco is really clear about the, um, the question of determinism, the question of whether or not these conditions do actually dispose us towards certain actions and limit our moral agency. He says, even if the heavens begin our motions, we have a light, um, coming back to that, to that metaphor of illumination that we see in so much of the canto. We have a light that helps us to determine right from wrong. And we have the capacity to make completely free choices, to choose what we would. He says that if each of us were not fundamentally free at the very core of our being, that there could be no justice, that there would be no reward for good action and no punishment for evil action. Um, and so he says, if the present world has gone astray, and I'm, I'm trying to find the lines exactly. Se il presente mondo, se il mondo presente disvia, in voi è la cagione, in voi si cheggia. Um, in you is the cause, in you let it be sought. He also makes um, a, a point that I want to raise, which I think is a really important one. He says that free will has to be trained especially if it's, if it's um, kind of um, cultivated or growing up in an environment in which the conditions that are placed on it orient it, or the, the, um, the, the um, position of the stars at that moment, orient it towards evil, um, that the free will has to struggle 
against the heavens. Um, he calls it the, um, its first battles, le prime battaglie col cielo. If in, it, for, if in its first battles with the heavens, it um, struggles well, then it can overcome all. Then free moral agency um, can commit itself to whatever it would choose. Um, and so I think, I think it's really, I've been thinking a lot about this canto in light of the, um, the conversations about systemic racism and systemic injustice that we're confronting as a culture right now. And so I, um, I keep kind of turning back to that idea of how much impact the, um, the heavens, however we want to think about that by analogy, how much impact they really do hold over our behaviors, but that it's our responsibility, it's our, um, it has to be our commitment to those things, to, to justice that can over, override those things, that can overcome all. All of this conversation does not imply that the soul is evil or is wrong or is oriented in the wrong way. Deborah, would you say something about the, um, the anima semplicetta lines and the, um, the idea of the happy maker? Well, when Marco begins to address Dante's question and he heaves, in fact, this, this sigh before answering and essentially uh, emphasizing what uh, Beth has just pointed out, that it is in, in us, in humanity, that the, we, have the, we have free will to make our choices. But how does the whole process begin? Marco talks about what, what happens with a baby, and that uh, the, the child is referred to as a fanchula, a little girl, also an anima semplicetta, again, a simple uh, young soul. And initially made by, oh, since all humanities create, breathe, well, God breathes life into every soul, uh, created by a happy maker, the baby responds initially to what makes her happy. And in another one of his works, The Convivio, this is Dante's treatise on philosophy, Dante uh, addresses this question somewhat differently. And so the process is something like this. The baby will turn a, yo a young child to something that pleases it, and that is first an apple. And then when one becomes a little older, it's a horse. Uh, so we're thinking, of course, what might appeal to a young child in uh, the 13th, 14th centuries in Dante's time, and that would be a horse who would have different desires today. And then as one becomes older, it then uh, it would be an adult. One might desire someone else. But what's important is not just this process of changing desires or progressing desires, but that our desires need to be guided. And the, here Marco begins answering the question of how we become, uh, uh, how, how our desires can turn wayward and how we can, be, uh, how we can become bad. What's essential to his thinking is, um, well, he, he then at this point becomes more philosophical and states that God ordained that there would be two sons, two mm -hmm. luminaries, and that's widely been interpreted as an emperor and a pope. And one, the emperor to, uh, to guide human, humanity through uh, the, the temporal realm and the pope to guide us spiritually. The problem is that there is no emperor. The Habsburg emperors, the German emperors, prefer to live, to stay in Germany. Therefore, there is this imperial vacancy. And throughout purgatory, Dante explores the consequences of this imperial vacancy. And it's largely created a lot of uh, division in not just in Italy, but across all of the Western empire. And the other problem is power hungry popes. The, 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 the church has joined the shepherd's crook, that's Dante's language, to the sword, a sign of imperial power. And in having usurped temple power, they now, uh, be, be, due to an absent empire, uh, emperor, um, things have run amok, terribly so, to the point where throughout this canto, Marco, whenever he talks about the, of the world, if one just looks at the, the, the different um, qualifiers used to 
um, to describe the Mondo, it's first um, a place bereft of every virtue. It's a blind world, Chaco. It's um, a, a, an evil world, real. And ultimately, Marco's answer is um, malacondotta. It's poor, bad governance that is responsible for the evil in the world. Mm. Uh, well, I, maybe I'll stop there and see if you wanted to add anything to this last bit. Sure. Uh, yeah, well, I, we're we're almost out of time, but I think um, you know you were talking about the the the, the vacuum of leadership and the um, the lack of a um, of a of a strong institute, a leading institution. And I think we, uh, we can't help but think, you know, precisely because it's it is July of 2020, and we are in the middle of a of a global pandemic. Um, and you and I are both living in the United States. That that call for centralized government sort of sounds all the more urgent, I think, to us in this uh, under these current circumstances. That that lack of centralization creates sort of patchworks of guidance or policies, and then a patchwork of health outcomes as a result mm -hmm. that sows the sort of chaos that that Marco is lamenting in his remarks. And Dante claims that we need a single leader to take the realm, the, to take the reins. I don't, I don't want to advocate authoritarianism. I don't think that's a, that's necessarily the solution to our, <laughs> our current problem. But I do think that many of us feel right now the kind of urgent need for a single respected virtuous institution that would lead the defense against this menace to the public health. So that, that um, I think we all kind of feel that vacuum of leadership precisely in this present moment. Yeah, the canto ends with the consequences of malacondotta, of um, a very bad leadership, poor government. And that is an ever dwindling number of virtuous people mm. uh, to lead. And at the end of the canto, Marco turns to, to the consequences and he looks at the condition in which um, people in present day in, in Lombardy at the time were, were dwelling and he can only think of three good men and these three good men reproach the, the new, that is the tyrannical uh, younger leaders, but they're not enough to extirpate evil in the universe. And so that is the, the sad ending of this canto. And one is left perhaps with the thought that the only renewal is in the afterlife. Um, unfortunately, we have to end it on a, on a sad note because I think we're already over time, but um, there's really so much to say about this canto. And Deborah, I want to thank you so much for, for sharing this conversation with me. Um, I also want to thank Alison Cornish of the Dante Society of America and all of the, the members of the Dante Society of America for spearheading this project and for putting it together. Um, Deborah, it was a pleasure speaking with you. And it was a pleasure speaking with you too, Beth. Okay, thank you so much and, and thank you to everyone who, who happens to be listening and take care. <laughs>